teraz poproszę o wygłoszenie wykładu inauguracyjnego naszego doktora honoris causa, pana Petera Greenawaya. Zapraszam. I love all this ceremony and ritual. So, thank you for allowing me to be part of this theater. It's a long time since I've been allowed to look like Erasmus. Thank you indeed for putting me in this position. I am excited and pleased and honored to be associated with this uh, situation. Thank you all very much indeed. I've often thought that my... I've often thought that my relationship with Poland in general was a curious one. You might not know this, but an awful long time ago when I was about 15 or 16, I was deeply impressed by the Polish filmmaking of that time. I'm sure you will remember it. The famous names of Widor and certainly Polanski were extremely impressionable in terms of what was certainly happening in Great Britain at that time. I'm sure as all good cineasts, you must know those last 20 minutes of Vida's Ashes and Diamonds. They certainly, remember I was 15, 16, they certainly made an enormous impression on me. And maybe somewhat naively, and certainly I suppose without really understanding the full circumstances, I was bold enough and maybe vainglorious enough to try to come to Poland to your famous film school and become a student here. But in my application indeed to come to the Polish film school, they said, we are sure that you are a bourgeois capitalist foreigner used to good sheets and good meals. And if you come to our film school, you will be living on cold tea and carrots and sleeping in a dormitory with 20 other people with smelly feet. <laughs> so why don't you make an application again in 10 years' time? Needless to say, lots of things happened in those 10 years and my life took a different direction. But it is interesting that now you honor me in this particular way how my origins, perhaps unbeknown to you, were to connect myself very much with the Polish film tradition. I suppose I must have been to Poland for at least maybe 30 or 40 times, not necessarily to this town, I think primarily, of course, as you'd expect, to Warsaw. I've been to film festivals here, and you have a lot of film festivals here, many times. Uh, we performed, some of you might know, about, I think, three or four years ago with a big VJ multi-screen celebration very close to where we are sitting now. And certainly, generously, you have given me the opportunity to use your taxpayers' money to make a film here. Uh, thank you for all that generosity, and I hope to come back. Thank <laughs> you. Very locally, as you understand, we have been uh, associated with a fairly modest exhibition of drawings here. We have also been associated very generously with a rather splendid catalog, which came off the, print, off the printer's presses this morning. And thank you again for the generosity of honoring me with this associated degree. Thank you. I know that you are a religious people, but I'm afraid your God has defeated me this morning. <laughs> I've sat there and I've watched the sun go round those three windows and thinking there's no way I can show you good people anything on this screen. So maybe I can only conclude that your God is antagonistic to my atheism. It's, of course, an ironic contradiction because I am profoundly knowledgeable about Christianity and certainly Roman Catholicism. 
And I was going to show you what we have done, probably with the greatest depiction of the Last Supper that we've had in the last 700 years. But to repeat, I think God's Son has defeated my wish to show you what we did with his son's Last Supper. It is interesting we are holding this ceremony in a place which is overcrowded with a huge amount of visual literacy. Most of it, I have to say, very confusing. There is a massive mix here of the sacred and the profane. And isn't it extraordinary how we've been able to be able to put a huge amount of activity from the Romano-Greek world with the Judo-Christian world and believe that we have created a synthesis. But I suppose, you know, cinema has been doing that now for what? At least 115 years. And I would certainly doubt the durability of that notion, uh, should we say, of visual literacy as a form of creating synthesis. And people here at this platform have been very generous about, I suppose, the continuum of my career being associated which, with something I regard of immense importance, and that is this notion of visual literacy. Now, I know you're a special audience of people who are either painters or associated with the whole business of notions of visual culture. But I think you know, and I know, and cinema certainly knows, that most people are visually illiterate. And I don't think it's necessarily the problem of the recipient, but it's the problem of the giver. Across all the language barriers, we are very sophisticated at communicating with text, either written or spoken. But our education systems, and this is not just true in Poland, it's true where I come from, and it's true, I think, certainly all over the Western world, that the importance of visual literacy drops out of the curriculum when we're aged about 12 or 13. I think this is a great tragedy, and I think it's the reason why we have such an impoverished cinema. Although it's a contradictory irony, we do not have an image-based cinema, we have a text-based cinema. When I came here about three and a half years ago to ask you for money to make a film about the great Dutch painter Rembrandt, I could not possibly convince you by producing four paintings, three lithographs, and a book of drawings. I had to convince you by producing a text. And you know, I suppose, in the last 10 years, the most significant cinematic events, for God's sake, have been Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. <laughs> and you know, these have not been turned into films. They have merely been turned into illustrated books. And I can see that you would agree with me that illustrated books is not cinema. So that makes me feel particularly honored to be associated indeed with the people who supported me here primarily, I suppose, as a painter. And although we talk about all these extraordinary excitements of the digital age, from notions, I suppose, of anything that a website can do, with VJ shows, with all sorts of new devices that technology has given us power to do, underlining all this activity is the notion of visual literacy, which for me resides very strongly in the whole phenomenon of painting. My career indeed did begin with the notion of my desire to be a painter, and I suppose everything I've been associated with heretofore has been very much associated with that highly sophisticated painting tradition of Western Europe. And the desire to express ideas in the most sophisticated visual way has always, I think, been at the very apogee of my determination. 
when I can make cinema about painting, or when I can make painting about cinema, then I am indeed a very happy man. And maybe just to finish, one of the projects we are now engaged in, which I hope to show you an example, was to try and create a bridge to make a dialogue between 8,000 years of European painting and only 115 years of cinema. 8,000 years is a long time to create a critical appreciation of notions of visual literacy in painting. And maybe sometimes it's a little, should we say, unjust to compare only the 115 years, if you believe indeed that cinema began in 1895, with this extraordinary painting inheritance. But if you think about it, in those 115 years, there have been millions and millions and millions of films made all over the world. Some people, of course, think that cinema was invented by the ancient Chinese in 500 BC. I will give you a new date. I think cinema was invented at the beginning of the 17th century. I believe cinema was invented essentially by those painters who began to paint artificial light very seriously for the first time. That would certainly include Caravaggio, certainly include Velasquez, certainly include Rubens, and almost certainly would include Rembrandt. So these, ladies and gentlemen, are the original Lumiere brothers. Cinema essentially is all about the manipulation of artificial light. And it's very, very difficult to find an excuse to elaborate anything more sophisticated than these four gentlemen that I've just mentioned. This attempt then to make a bridge between cinema and painting is a very long project. We started it in, uh, 20, in the year 2006, and we will still, I'm sure, continue for at least another six years. Very simply and very basically, it is a personal one-to-one -one dialogue I suppose, between very contemporary state-of-the-art cinematic technology and these extraordinary painters. And again, very simply, it is associated with actually projecting very new cinema on these extraordinary masterpieces. We have tackled Rembrandt's very famous painting called The Night Watch. We were invited to Milan to indeed project state-of-the-art cinema on the original Da Vinci Last Supper, a painting which I'm sure you know is now believed to have been painted by Dan Brown. <laughs> and last year, which was the year Venice both had a Biennale painting show and also, of course, as it does annually, had a Venice Film Festival, so it was an extraordinary opportunity to bring painting and cinema together. We tackled an amazing painting by Veronese called The Marriage at Cana. It might be called The Marriage of Cana for some, but I think you know and I know that it's really The Marriage of Christ. We are now tackling an extraordinary painting by Velasquez called Las Meninas and also another extraordinary painting by Picasso called Guernica. We are tackling a Monet in Paris and a Sura in Chicago, and then a Jackson Pollock in New York. That for me will be very rewarding because you know the laptop generation is accused of believing there is no painting before Jackson Pollock and no cinema before Tarantino. And then at the end of the series, the creme de la creme, the painting I'm really looking forward to, is related to probably what you know last November that the Vatican has tried to recreate an association of commission with its institutions and the whole phenomenon of contemporary art. Uh, we have developed a dialogue now with the Vatican to allow me, a secularist and an atheist, to project on one of the greatest Roman Catholic paintings of all time, which is Michelangelo's Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel. K 
Can you imagine some Peters where Bernini had been allowed to play with electricity? There's a lot of talk now about the phenomenon of the multimedia artist. But of course, you know, and I know, the multimedia artists have been around with us for a very long time. I was always greatly humbled by the fact that somebody like Michelangelo not only was a great poet and a great sculptor and certainly a great painter, but he also made wedding cakes. So, please be my guest in the Sistine Chapel in October 2014. I will see you there. So, to finally finish, and I'm already taking too long, but you're very lucky because if I'd been allowed to show films, I'd be here much longer. So, I thank you for your generosity and for your goodwill and indeed for this singular honor. Thank you all very much.